بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار in the last lesson we looked at uh, the issue of the angels uh, because imam at-tahawi rahimahullah he made a mention of the angels the prophets and the books within one sentence so he said wa nu'minu bil malaikati wan nabiyyin wal kutubil munazzalati 'ala al-mursalin wa nashhadu annahum kanu 'ala al-haqq al-mubin that we believe in the angels and the prophets and the books that were sent upon the messengers and we testify that they were upon the clear manifest truth so our discussion in the last lesson or the last two lessons was on the angels and so today we are going to focus upon the prophets one nabiyin the prophets so the prophets belief in the prophets when we say that we believe in the prophets and nabiyin uh, this word an nabiyin it also includes the mursalin the messengers so when we say or when at tahawi says in this point wa nu'minu bil malaikati wan nabiyin we believe in the angels and the prophets and the prophets here is inclusive of all of the messengers as well this is because when the word prophet or prophets is used and it's left open then this automatically includes all of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the reason for this there are two reasons the first reason is that it is the view of many of the scholars that every messenger is a prophet every messenger is automatically a prophet and this discussion of what's the definition of a prophet what's the definition of a messenger a nabi a rasul we look at that a little later in the lesson inshallah ta'ala but upon the view that many of the scholars say that every messenger every rasul is automatically treated to be a prophet this is the first angle why when we use the word al anbiya and an nabiyin this means all of the messengers as well uh, the second angle is that when we look in the quran and we see in many of the surahs and chapters of the quran uh, we see that the messengers the rusul the messengers are mentioned by way of mentioning of the the prophets in other words the messengers are named as prophets in the quran in the quran allah refers to a messenger as a prophet so we see that in the quran as well the word nabi is used in reference to the to the uh, messengers and there are certain surahs in the quran uh, we see uh, for for example uh, surah al anbiya and there are many other surahs surah al a'raf we see that within these chapters of the quran we see the mention of ibrahim alayhi salam muhammad alayhi salam nuh lut dawood all of the messengers of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so from this angle this is the first point that we make when we use the word an nabiyin automatically we include all of the messengers of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala however the shaykh makes a point here which is that it is better to use the word ar rusul that when we speak of our belief because this is what we find in the quran first and foremost in the verses of the quran when allah mentions the pillars of iman he uses the word rusul an example of that is the statement of allah right at the end of surah al baqarah when allah says aman ar rusul bima unzila ilayhi min rabbih wal mu'minun kullu amana billahi wa malaikatihi war rusulih so he says the messenger believes in that which is revealed to him from his lord as do the believers all of them believe in allah his angels his books and wa rusulih and his messenger so he used the word rusul and also in the hadith of jibril the famous hadith of jibril we see that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said and tu'mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulih that you believe in allah 
and you believe in the angels and you believe in his books and his messengers are rusul so we see that the word ar rusul when we speak of our belief because it is from the pillars of iman uh, to use the word uh, ar rusul then we stick to that word rather than the word an nabiyin so it is obligatory upon a person to believe in all of the prophets and the messengers together without any distinction because this is what Allah has ordered us in the Quran. So after this brief introduction, we now have a number of points, maybe five or six points that are connected to this. So the first point then is what is the definition of a Nabi? What is the definition of a prophet? And in the Quran, we see that there are two ways to recite the word an Nabi, depending on which transmission of the Quranic text that we have. So in one reading, we say the word an Nabi, an Nabi, like in the saying of Allah, Ya ayyuhan Nabi, is an Nabi. And another reading is an Nabi, an Nabi, which is Hamza at the end. So we have Alif Lam for the article, Noon Ba. Ya Shadda with a Dhamma. This is an Nabiyu. An Nabiyu. Another reading is Alif Lam Noon with a, with a definite article Noon Ba Ya and then a Hamza at the end. An Nabiyu. An Nabiyu. These are two ways to recite this word in the Quran upon the different uh, recitations. So, what is the meaning of each of these two different readings? So, when we say the word um, an Nabi with a Hamza at the end, An Nabi with a Hamza at the end. This means someone who has been informed and notified, someone to whom knowledge has been given. This is An Nabi O, An Nabi O, and this is from the word Nabba. Uh, to inform, to inform someone, to notify someone. So a prophet is the one who has been informed. This is the word an nabi with a hamza. As for the other one, an nabi yu, an nabi with a ya mushaddada at the end, an nabi This means a person who becomes uh, raised above others besides him. There's a word which is called nabwatin, nabwatun. This simply means someone who becomes elevated and raised. So an nabi one who is informed, given information. And an nabi one who is raised, his station is raised. He becomes higher than other people. So, so what we do is when we take these two meanings, we take these two meanings, we put, them, we put both of them together, and we understand that the Prophet is someone whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen specifically to inform him with certain things. So he gives him certain information. And then, because he has received such information, he, his position is elevated. Right? So he becomes raised. He has a station above other people. Why? Because of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to him and sent down upon him. So this is just really to help us understand that these two different words, an nabi and an nabi right? These are the two meanings that they, that they carry. So this is a prophet. As for a messenger, then it is, a messenger means the one who is sent. The one who is sent. And so we see that these two words, an nabi and ar rasul, the word nabi it carries the meaning of being informed and receiving a message, being informed and receiving a message. But the word rasul means being sent as a messenger. Right? Understand that it's important that you understand the distinction at this point because we elaborate upon this a bit later on as well. So when we look at a prophet, a prophet is someone who receives information and so he, 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 receive, he, he, he is informed of something and he is given a message. So the word is al-imba and ar-risala. These are two words in Arabic. Al-imba, to be informed, ar-risala, 
meaning to have a message. But as for a messenger, then he is the one who is sent to someone or to a people with a message. Right? So we need to be clear about that uh, distinction. Okay, so once we've understood these are the meanings of these words, then the scholars have discussed this issue. Is every prophet a messenger? Is every messenger a prophet? Right? So what's the what's the what's the what's the answer to this question? And the answer to this question is that the scholars have differed on this issue. There are many uh, different uh, positions. Uh, we'll mention two of them. The first saying is that many of the scholars said that every prophet is a messenger, every messenger is a prophet. Right? So there are many scholars who held this particular view from the jurists and the people of tafsir and other than them. So this is one view. Right? They're exactly the same, there's no difference between them. The second view is that a prophet is other than a messenger, is not the same as a messenger. And this view, as we shall see, is in fact the, 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 the stronger, better view. And there are many evidences which indicate this to us. So what are these evidences? The first evidence is in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see him clearly distinguishing between a prophet and a messenger in the same verse. In the same verse. An example of that is in Surah Al-Hajj, the 22nd Surah, verse number 52. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ إِلَّا إِذَا تَمَنَّا أَلْقَ الشَّيْطَانُ فِي أُمْنِيَّتِهِ Allah says that, ne- that we never sent before you a messenger, nor a prophet. A messenger, nor a prophet. Except that when, except that shaitan, he tried to throw something into the, like into, into the soul or into the thinking or into the, you know, of, of, that, of that messenger or of that prophet. Then Allah continues how he invalidates what shaitan throws you know, to the end of the verse. But the point here is that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He distinguished between a messenger and a prophet. He mentioned them separately. مِن رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ So this indicates that a prophet then is other than a messenger. Otherwise, there was no need to mention them separately if there, if there, if there, was, no, there was no difference. And it wouldn't have been correct to say مِن رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ This would, wouldn't be even correct. So that's the first point made here to show the difference between the Prophet and a Messenger. The second point is that in the uh, that in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said he mentioned he mentions this long hadith, but he mentions in this hadith how the prophets will come and one of them he says one of them will come and he will have a group of people with him. A prophet will come, يأتي النبي ومعه الرحط. A prophet will come and with, be, with him will be like a group of people. Then he says, another prophet will come and with him will be such and such. Then he says, and another prophet will come and will, with him will be nobody. He will have nobody with him at all. So the proof, how is this a proof? The proof is, that when the messenger said in this hadith, وَيَأْتِي النَّبِيُّ وَلَيْسَ مَعَهُ أَحَدْ That a prophet comes and there is no one with him at all. What, what is the meaning of this? A prophet will come on his own on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, no followers, nobody with him. What we understand from this is that there can be two things understood. One is that no one listened to him, no one obeyed him, no one followed him at all. So he came on his own. This is one understanding. Or the second understanding was that he wasn't actually sent to anyone. Right? So he received revelation, but he wasn't ordered to go and call anyone. Right? So this means that he falls in that definition of prophet that we mentioned earlier on. One who receives knowledge and receives a message. And that's it. Right? He's not ordered to be a messenger to go and call somebody else and to go and spread that message, right? So this hadith then, and this part of this hadith, is something that supports the view 
that a prophet is someone other than a messenger. And we see that uh, it can also be the case that this prophet who came by himself, that he was not ordered to go to anybody else. And the hadith that the Shaykh mentions here, uh, uh, which is, in which there occurs that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi he said that never did Allah send a prophet except that he gave him signs. He gave him signs. The likes of which, on account of which, a certain group of people believed in him in accordance with what that sign was. And that which I have been given is wahi, is revelation which is recited. So in the hadith it means that each prophet is given a sign, such a sign, that to the extent of that sign, a certain amount of people believe in him. And that I, meaning the, the messenger, have been given a revelation which is recited. This is the sign of the messenger of Allah. And of course, this is the greatest sign, and the messenger has the greatest of the followers. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Uh, the angle from which this hadith is used is simply in connection with the previous hadith, is that maybe it is the case that a prophet who comes by himself on Yawm al Qiyamah, even though he was given a sign, he wasn't ordered to go and call you know, uh, the people. So that's the second angle or the second angle from which we can say that the prophet is other than a messenger. And then the Shaykh mentions a third evidence, which is a hadith which not all the scholars agree is authentic. Some say it's authentic, some say it's not. But in this hadith, it's a long hadith, and in this hadith, a messenger of Allah, he mentions the number of messengers and the number of prophets. So in this hadith, he says that the number of prophets is 124,000. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent 124,000 messengers upon this earth. Sorry, uh, prophets upon this earth. 100,000 prophets upon this earth. And as for the number of messengers, he said that they were the same as the number of the people who participated in the battle of Badr, which is 318. 300 or 314, sorry. 314 or around 314 uh, messengers. So Allah sent 314 messengers. So again, the fact that the messenger distinguished between prophets and messengers in this hadith, which some of the people of knowledge consider to be authentic, then this is another evidence that supports the distinction made between a prophet and a messenger. So, from this, from the verse in the Qur'an, and from those two or three hadith, we now know that there is clearly some distinction to be made between a prophet and a messenger. The Qur'an distinguish between them, mention them separately in the same verse, and likewise in the sunnah we see indications of the same thing. So now a difference is established. Now the next question is, what is this difference then? What is the difference between a prophet and a messenger? Again, in explaining this point, we see that the scholars have given different explanations on this as well. And we'll mention two of those, the first of them, the first view is that a prophet is someone to whom a legislation has been revealed, right? So Allah reveals to him a legislation, you know, commands, prohibitions, worship Allah alone, and then the, 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 the commands and prohibitions to do with ibadah and so on and so forth. So he's given a legislation. It's revealed upon him. However, he is not ordered to make tabligh to convey this revelation, or to convey this legislation. Right, so he just receives the revelation, and he acts upon it, he abides by it, but Allah didn't command him to go and start calling, you know, and to convey this message to other people. That's a prophet. As for the messenger, then it is the one who is sent a legislation, revelation is sent to him, and then Allah orders him, commands him, go and convey this to other people. Right? So this is one view, this is the first view of the distinction between a prophet and a messenger. So what is the key difference then here? The key difference is what? It is tabligh. The key difference here in the view of these scholars is the issue of conveying. 
Right? That's the difference. A prophet is not ordered to convey, make tabligh of the, of the message. A messenger is ordered to make tabligh of the message. So, this is one view. And the second view is a view of, a well-known view. It's the view of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. And he mentioned this view in one of his books called An-Nubuwat. An-Nubuwat is an excellent book of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah in which he discusses the issue of prophethood and miracles and you know, things which are connected to, 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 to that. So in this book, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he outlines a view and this is how he explains the view, the difference between a prophet and a messenger. He says that a messenger and a prophet... Of course, we accept that they receive revelation, right? However, he says that both of them are sent. Both of them are in fact ordered and sent to a people to call and to convey. And the proof that Ibn Taymiyyah uses for that is in the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Anbiya, I believe, Surah 21 verse 25 it is. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ Sorry, it's the ayah that we mentioned earlier on. It's the ayah in Surah Al-Hajj. Yeah, it's the same ayah. Surah Al-Hajj, verse number 52. So in Surah 22, verse number 52, Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ So what's the evidence from this? Look at what Allah says. Allah said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا He said, never did we send وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا Never did we send. So he, he mentioned sending. Then he said, of any messenger, مِنْ رَسُولٍ وَلَا نَبِيٍ Or any prophet. This means that the irsal, the sending, mentioned at the beginning of the ayah, relates to both the prophet and the messenger. Because Allah said, never did we send any messenger or any prophet. This means, therefore, that a messenger and a prophet have been you know, have been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they share in that thing. So uh, this means that a Rasul is Mursal, he's sent by Allah, and a Nabi is Mursal. Okay. Now this is this is very clear from the from this evidence in the in the ayah. Now the question is that although we agree that they have been sent Who they have been sent to is where the point of difference lies. Who are they being sent to? We, we agree now that a prophet is sent and a messenger is sent. But who are they being sent to? Well, a messenger is sent, a rasul is sent to a people who oppose him in the foundation of the religion. Right? So this is whom a messenger is sent to. A people who are, who are in opposition to him in the very asal, in the very foundation of the message, meaning in the foundation of Tawheed. This is, no, this is from Ibn Taymiyyah. Yeah, summarized from Ibn Taymiyyah. But it is the view outlined by Ibn Taymiyyah. Yeah. So a messenger is sent to a people, a rasul is sent to a people who oppose the religion in the foundations, so he commands them with Tawheed and he prohibits them from shirk. This is a messenger. And these are the people to whom he is sent. As for a prophet, then a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he is sent to a people who are already in agreement with the message. They already agree with the message. They don't dispute the message. Right? So he is sent to revive, to renew and to revive the message. Not to call them from the very foundations to the message. And so... Uh, an example here is all of the prophets that were sent to Bani Israel, all of them were prophets because they were simply reviving the message of Musa alayhi salam, the message of Musa alayhi salam. So when we see every time a prophet came and passed away, another prophet came after him, and this continued amongst Bani Israel, and all of them were simply calling to the message of Musa alayhi salam and to the Sharia of Musa alayhi salam. And they weren't sent, you know, to call a opposing people to, to, to that message. Now this definition is the most correct. When we look at all of the evidences together, we see that this is most correct 
to, to, the, to the texts in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah, that yes, a prophet receives revelation. Yes, a messenger receives revelation. Yes, both of them are ordered to convey the message. At this point, everything is the same. So from this angle, a prophet is the same as a messenger, the messenger is the same as a prophet. But what is the real difference? The real difference is, is a messenger is called to a people who from the foundation are not in agreement with the message. So he calls them to the foundations, orders them with tawheed, prohibits them from shirk. That's a messenger. And a prophet, therefore, is someone who calls to a people who already agree with the message. Now, this distinction is important because some of the things that we mentioned earlier on, or mentioned later on in a short while, they would actually make, make sense. And this leads us to the second point now. So we finished the definition, difference between prophet and a messenger. Now we move to the second point. The second point is that all of the prophets and messengers, we hold that they have different degrees. Some of them are more superior and excellent than others. And this tafdeel, this, you know, tafdeel meaning some are more excellent than others, this is mentioned in the Qur'an itself. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, تِلْكَ الرُّسُلُ فَضَّلْنَا بَعْدَهُمْ عَلَى بَعْدٍ مِنْهُمْ مَنْ كَلَّمَ اللَّهِ وَرَفَعَ بَعْدَهُمْ دَرَجَاتٍ In this ayah, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 253, Surah 2, verse 253, Allah says, these are the messengers, or those are the messengers. Those are the messengers. Some of them we made to be superior than others. And amongst them are those whom Allah spoke to directly. And some of them, he raised in degrees and ranks. So therefore, by textual evidence in the Qur'an, we believe that amongst the messengers, uh, some of them are better than others, and amongst the prophets, some of them are better than others, and they are not all at the same level and the rank. So the first prophet is Adam, alayhi salam, Adam, alayhi salam, and the last prophet is Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And this is prophethood And as for the first messenger The first messenger is, is Nuh Alayhi Salam And the final messenger is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Adam is a prophet Because we have evidence In the authentic hadith The messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He said Adamu Nabiyun Mukallamun which, which means that Adam is a Nabi that was spoken to. He was spoken to, meaning spoken to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the definition of a prophet applies to Adam alayhi salam because Allah the mighty and majestic spoke to him and also revealed to him wahi. He sent wahi, revelation to him. Okay, so then after this, the prophets and messengers amongst them are those who are referred to as the Ulul Azm. The Ulul Azm. The Ulul Azm are those who are the firmly determined, resolute, patient messengers. Ulul Azm. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commands the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He says to him, Fasbir kama sabara Ulul Azmi min al rusul Fasbir. كَمَا صَبَرَ أُولُ الْعَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ He says, have patience. Just like the أُولُ الْعَزْمِ Just like those with firm determination from the messengers had patience. Okay, so now this description that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave in this ayah, أُولُ الْعَزْمِ أُولُ الْعَزْمِ Who is this referring to? Who are these messengers who are said to be the firmly determined, patient uh, messengers? And so the scholars differed regarding this uh, interpretation. So from them were those who said that the Ulul Azm amongst the messengers are, is, is uh, meaning those who have patience, those who show patience and so on and so forth in the, in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he says uh, that they are every single messenger. So every messenger is automatically from the Ulul Azm. Why? Because they stood in or amongst and against the enemies of Allah. They had patience, they showed patience. And so every messenger, because he has a share of this, because a messenger by definition, 
he was sent to a people who oppose him, so he had to have patience, and so on and so forth. Then, every messenger therefore is from the Ulul Azm. Ulul Azm. And then they also explain, there's a, a grammatical point here, a grammatical issue in this verse, which is that in, the, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ulul Azmi minar Rusul. He used the particle min. Ulul Azmi minar Rusul. Now this word min means of or from. Of or from. Now in Arabic, this word can be used in a number of different ways. It can mean a part of something, like a part of something, right? So for example, you know, a person, uh, you know, he took, um, you know, he took something from, from the dates. So he didn't take all the dates, he took some of the dates, right? Or it can also mean he took from the dates, meaning he took some dates, meaning the actual thing itself, right? So this word in Arabic can be used in one of these two ways. Uh, in Arabic, the terms are tab'idiyya, tab'idiyya, meaning like partial, to take something, take a part of something. And the other word is bayaniya, which means that it's just to explain that he took <coughs> that thing. Right? So, he took, so he, took, he took some dates. Right? Or it can mean he took from the dates, meaning he took some of the dates rather than all of the dates. Right? So these scholars who have the view and say that every messenger is from the ulul azm, they say that this, this word min in this ayah is used in the second sense. Used in the sense to mean that they are from the messengers as a whole. Right? So this is the first view. And the second view which is more correct and more strong because it's supported by evidences in the Quran itself is the view, uh, or in fact this is the second of three views the second view is that there are 18 messengers who are from the Ulul Azm 18 messengers and these 18 messengers are the ones who are mentioned in the Quran in particular in Surah Al-An'am the sixth surah of the Quran makes mention of 18 messengers. The names of 18 messengers are in this surah. And so all of these messengers in the view of this group of scholars, they say that these 18 are the Ulul Azm. Ulul Azm. The third view is that the Ulul Azm are just five in number. There are just five messengers who are said to be from the firmly <coughs> patient you know, firmly determined. And these five are mentioned in two places in the Quran. In the first place, or uh, in the in, in one verse in the Quran, uh, in Surah Al-Shura, the 42nd Surah, verse number 13, Allah, say, Allah says, شَرَعَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الدِّينَ مَا وَصَّى بِهِ نُوحًا That Allah has legislated for you of the religion what he legislated for Nuh, or what he advised Nuh with, the Prophet Nuh. وَالَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ And likewise that which we reveal to you, meaning Muhammad. So we have Nuh and Muhammad. Then he said, وَمَا وَصَّيْنَا بِهِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ And that which we sent to Ibrahim. وَمُوسَى And Musa And Isa And Isa which is an aqimud din wa la tatafarraqu what is this message it is to establish the deen implement the deen and do not be divided do not be divided therein so in this ayah allah mentioned all of these prophets including muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam even though not by name but by indication then we see in another ayah in the quran in surah al ahzab surah number 33 the 33rd surah Verse number seven. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa id akhadna minan nabiyina mithaqahum, wa minka, wa min nuh, wa ibrahim, wa musa, wa isa ibn maryam, wa akhadna minhum mithaqan ghalida. Which translates, When we took from the prophets a mithaq, a covenant, an agreement, and from you, so addressing Muhammad alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa then he said, and from Nuh, and from Ibrahim, and Musa, and Isa. He mentioned all five together in the same verse. So, the fact that these five have been mentioned specifically in two parts in the Quran, in two verses of the Quran, 
This indicates that this view is the most correct. And another evidence that supports this even further is the hadith, the well-known long hadith, which speaks of Yomul Qiyamah, how people will be, how they will come uh, uh, when they are resurrected and they will be standing and waiting for the judgment and uh, the terror will be great on that day and they will, they will have been standing for ages and ages and ages and ages waiting for Allah to come and commence the uh, judgment between the creation and so then what will happen uh, as occurs in this hadith is that they will come to Adam alayhi salam and ask Adam to intercede and then he, he will say, I, you know, I can't do anything. Then they will go to Nuh. Nuh is the first messenger. Then they will go to Ibrahim, Islam. Then they will go to Musa, Islam. They will go to Isa, Islam. And then they will go to the messenger Muhammad, sallallahu sal- alaihi wasallam. So we have six people here. Adam, obviously, he is a prophet, so he is removed from the collection of messengers. But the remaining five, which are mentioned. All of them are from the same messengers that are mentioned in the verses in the Qur'an. So this hadith actually supports the view that the ulul azm, the firmly determined patient messengers who have the highest rank, are the five, Muhammad, Isa, Musa, Ibrahim, and Nuh, alayhim salam. This now leaves us, moves us to the third uh, point in our discussion of the prophets and the third point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we believe that Allah gives to every single prophet and messenger he gives them ayat ayat signs ayat and in a hadith which is authentic the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ما بعث الله من نبي إلا وأعطاه من الآيات ما على مثله آمن البشر. He says that the prophet that that Allah never sent any prophet except that He gave him such signs that they believed amongst men the likes of that, meaning the likes that was in accordance with those signs. So this hadith establishes that Allah gave to every single prophet signs. Uh, ayat and why did he send them those signs these ayat were sent why to prove the truthfulness of the messenger or of the prophet to show that they are being truthful in what they are claiming of receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or claiming to be a prophet now in the Quran when we look in every place that Allah speaks of a sign or an evidence there are only two words which are used. These two words are either ayat, either the word ayah is used, or the word burhan is used. These are the words in the Quran and the Sunnah. Ayah and burhan. As for the word mu'jiza, the word mu'jiza, which means miracle, the word miracle, this word is not actually found in the texts. This is not found in the Qur'an nor the Sunnah. This is not a word of the Sharia. The word of the Sharia is ayah or it is burhan. But this word mu'jiza, a miracle, this word actually is something used uh, that came in the second century uh, of Islam when ilmul kalam appeared amongst the ummah. Ilmul kalam that we've spoken of many, many times before. And the people who brought this word were the mu'tazila. The mu'tazila. They brought this word uh, al-mu'jiza. Al-mu'jiza, al-mu'jiza mean in English we translate to uh, is be, as being a miracle, but in Arabic it means that something which leaves someone else powerless, someone which leaves someone else incapable, that they're not able to match this thing or do this thing or bring this thing. This is a, a word. Now, is there anything wrong with using this word mu'jiza? We have to be careful because. Although it's not prohibited to use this word, mu'jiza, we have to be careful uh, in the way that we use it because we have to use it with a meaning that agrees with the sharia. Because these people, as, as we've said before, the people of Kalam, they take certain words, they have certain words 
al mujiza and many other things, and they have an understanding of that word which which has errors and has mistakes. And so when we use these words, we have to be careful uh, between them. So what is the difference between a, these two words, al-ayah and burhan, which are the correct Sharia words, and the word mu'jizah? The word ayah and burhan, first of all, we see that there is evidence for them in the Qur'an. Because these are the words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used, the word ayah, the word burhan, these are used in the Qur'an. That's the first thing. And the word al mujiza has no evidence for it at all. The second is that the word ayah and the word burhan is very clear in its meaning. Very clear. An ayah is a sign. A burhan is an evidence. Something apparent, clear to see. It's very, there's no confusion. It's very clear and apparent. But as for the word mujiza, the word mujiza is an ambiguous, it's a bit general, too general. And it's general because, okay, if this thing is a miracle, a mu'jiza, mu'jiza means it is something which has made somebody else incapable. They are powerless to bring the likes of this thing, right? So, who is this referring to? Is it referring to uh, the whole of mankind? Is it referring to just the people to whom the messenger was sent, the Arabs? Is it referring to the jinn as well? Is it referring to the jinn and the men? So who, who is this thing a mu'jizah to? Who is it to? This is where the ambiguity lies, right? Who is it referring to? And because of this ambiguity, because this is a, an ambiguous word, we find that it's not used in the Qur'an or the Sunnah. Rather we see the word used is ayah, sign, or burhan. Because the meaning of this is very apparent and clear. An ayah, burhan, is something that's so clear and apparent. It's like the sun visible on a, on, on, on a clear day. There's no you know, confusion about an ayah or a, or a burhan. So for that reason, because of that, you see that those people who use the word mu'jizah, even amongst themselves, they differed as to its definition. Why? Because it's ambiguous by nature. So the Mu'tazila differed you know, about the meaning of the word Mu'jizah, what is its definition, who does it apply to. So the Ahlul Kalam, they differed amongst each other, what is the meaning of this word. And that's because they chose a word that itself is not based upon the Qur'an or the Sunnah. Whereas we, we stick to the word Ayah, Ayah and Burhan. So after this, uh, the Shaykh mentions a point here which is, that if we were to use the word mu'jizah, let's say we were to use the word mu'jizah, then it would be used to mean the whole of jinn and men, meaning that this miracle applies to the whole of the jinn and men. And this is because in the Quran, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, قُلْ لَإِنِ اجْتَمَعَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْدُهُمْ لِبَعْدٍ Say. If all of the jinn and the men were to gather together to bring the likes of this Qur'an, they would, not like, they would not be able to bring the likes of this Qur'an, even if they were supporters and aiders of each other. Okay, so if we were to use the word mu'ajiza, miracle, then it would mean that this word miracle is in reference to the whole of mankind and the whole of jinn. That all of mankind and all of jinn are not able to bring the likes of this uh, miracle. However, we stick to the word ayah, and Burhan, because these words mean a clear evidence, a clear evidence which we stick to. And it is so clear because it is like the sun, the, you know, the light of the sun is so apparent to everybody and is not hidden or, or ambiguous. And likewise, we see in the Quran, Allah mentions ayat when he sent to Fir'aun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Fi tis'i ayatin ila Fir'aun wa qawmihi. Allah says, Allah says, in nine signs sent to Fir'aun and his people. Surah Naml, Surah 27, verse number 12. And likewise, Allah says, فَذَانِكَ بُرْحَانَانِ مِنْ Rabbik. Allah says, and these are two evidences, two burhans from your Lord. Again, to, uh, to uh, this is in reference to Musa, alayhi salam. And... 
In another part of the Quran, Surah Taha, Allah again referring to Musa Islam, He says, "Wadmum yadaka ila janahika takhruj bayda min ghayr min ghayr su." That place your hand in your, you know, in your in your garment, and then it will come out white, bright, without any harm or evil or anything like that. He says, "Ayatan ukhra as another sign. لِنُورِيَّكَ مِنْ آيَاتِنَا الْكُبْرَى That we may show to you our great signs, ayat. So we see in the Qur'an, burhan and ayah. This is a sharia usage of these words. And so therefore we should stick to using these words and avoid the word a miracle, al-mu'jiza, because this is an ambiguous uh, word. This now leads us to the fourth issue, which is what is the meaning of having faith in the prophets and messengers. It means that we believe, meaning that when we have iman in this pillar of iman, what is required from us to believe so that our pillar is valid and correct. It is as follows. That we believe that Allah the mighty and majestic, He sent the messengers and He aided them. He sent the messengers and He aided them. And that they were the most upright, righteous people of their time. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He supported them with ayat and baraheen. Ayat and baraheen. He supported them and aided them to prove their truthfulness. To prove their truthfulness to the people that they were sent to. And that they were the most pious and righteous of people and they were the most knowledgeable of people of their Lord right so these five or six things when we say that we believe in the messengers you know that we believe in the messengers what is this what is the details of this belief these are the five or six components let me repeat them again that when we say that we believe in the messengers we believe that Allah the mighty and majestic he chose and sent specific people as messengers. He chose them and sent them. And obviously he sent revelation to them. And these people, these individuals, were the most righteous people of their time. Muhammad was the most righteous person amongst all of the people. And likewise with Isa and Musa and Ibrahim and Nuh alayhim salam. And Allah supported them with ayat and baraheen with ayat and baraheen, with signs and evidences which proved their truthfulness and that they were the most pious of all of the people with respect to their Lord and they were the most knowledgeable of all of the people of their Lord. Right? So this is what it entails that we believe in the messengers. We believe in all of these components with uh, res respect to them. Now this means that we believe in every single prophet, whether we know that prophet, meaning whether we know that prophet's name or not. Because from the prophets and messengers are those whom Allah has mentioned to us, and those whom He hasn't. Allah says in the Quran, "Minhum man qasasna alika, wa minhum man lam nak wa minhum man lam naksus alik." But from them are those whom we have rehearsed them to you. And amongst them are those whom we have not rehearsed to you. And so this is clear that there are many prophets and messengers whom we do not have any knowledge of. So having belief in the prophets and messengers then, there are two levels to this belief. Just like we mentioned regarding the angels, there are two levels. There is al-iman al-mujmal and then is there is al-iman al-mufassal. Right? So the iman which is ijmali, the iman which is general, this is the iman you have to bring for this pillar to be valid. If you don't bring this Iman, your pillar in belief of the messengers is not valid. And this Iman, this general Iman, is to believe in every single messenger and prophet that Allah sent, whether we know him or do not know him. Right? This is what we believe in a general sense, on account of which our Iman bir Rusul is valid. Of course, we believe that they were the most righteous people, they were sent revelation, they were supported by Allah by, by signs and evidences for their truthfulness and a few of the things that we mentioned earlier on. So when a person brings these details and he says, I believe in all the prophets and messengers, even though I don't know their names, 
and I believe such and such, then he has brought a valid, correct pillar uh, with respect to belief in the prophets and messengers. Then after this point, there is the detailed iman, and this is when we come to know of a prophet, for example, that we did not know of, and we know, and we come to learn of specific details about his messengership and his and his prophethood, and we seeing and we start seeing the details in the Quran or in the Sunnah. So we see, see things mentioned about Musa alayhi salam or Isa alayhi salam or Ibrahim alayhi salam, be that in the Quran, be that in the Sunnah. Right? Then every time we come across this knowledge, then it you know increases uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in our Iman with respect to the prophets and messengers. So we add to this uh, that, we, that we love them and we have allegiance towards them that all of them are the most perfect of the creation in terms of their tawheed and their iman and their obedience to Allah and their fear of Allah. So all of these things we, we believe in the, in, in, you know, with respect to the prophets and messengers. And then specifically with respect to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and of course there is a specific detail with respect to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that is that we believe that Muhammad bin Abdullah, Muhammad bin Abdullah al Hashimi al Qurashi, was from the tribe of the Quraysh, that he is the one to whom Allah sent to the whole of mankind, in fact, to the whole of the jinn as well. We believe that he is the seal of the prophets and messengers. We have to believe that he is the seal, that he was sent with Islam, the completion of Islam, which abrogated everything which came before it. And that every claim to any other religion or way is false and it is rejected. Allah says in the Quran, Walakir Rasulullahi wa khataman nabiyyin. But he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets. And so Allah sealed the prophethood by way of the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he revealed the Quran upon him. The Quran is a, a hujjah, is a proof for the whole of his ummah up until the establishment of the hour. Now believing in the mess, so obviously we've discussed believing in all of the prophets and messengers in a general sense, but belief in the prophet Muhammad is very specific and special. And so how does a believer believe, what, how is his, his iman correct when he says, I believe in the prophet Muhammad Well, there has to be four elements. There are four elements. When you say, when a person basically says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. When you are testifying that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, for your testification to be correct and to be valid, and for you to be truly implementing what you are professing, what you are claiming, what you are claiming to testify to, then there are four elements behind this. And this is important for every single Muslim to understand. So what does this mean? It means, first of all, to believe in every single thing which the Messenger Muhammad brought information about. Right? This is part and parcel of you making the shahada, of testifying that he is the Messenger. It means that you make tasdeeq, you believe as being truthful every single in piece of information that he brought whether it be about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it be about the nations of the past, whether it be about paradise, hellfire, the affairs of the unseen, about Ad-Dajjal, about Isa Islam when he returns, about all of the things. So every bit of information, every khabar that he brought, that you make tasdeeq of that. Right? Whether your mind accepts it or not. Right? Hadith about the punishment of the grave. Hadith, many of the hadith which are which are found in the sunnah. This is the first element of you being truthful in your declaration of the, the, the shahada, in, uh, specifically the testimony that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. Then the second thing is to obey him in whatever he commanded. To obey him in whatever he commanded. To make ta'ah, to be obedient to his commands. The third thing is to refrain from whatever he prohibited. To refrain from whatever he prohibited. This is a third element which validates your, you know, which, which, which is required for your shahada to be, to be correct and truthful. 
And the fourth thing is that you do not worship Allah except by what the Messenger legislated. Except by what the Messenger legislated. So your ibad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be upon the Sharia, the legislation, the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, this is what it actually means to testify that there is none which has the right to be worshipped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad is his messenger. This is what you are really professing and this is your evidence that you are truthful and sincere when you say that I believe the messenger is the Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these four elements are, the, uh, are things which are elaborated upon by the scholars when they speak of the shahada. But this is, when someone says to you, what is the meaning of the shahada? I testify that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. What does it mean? Then you explain these are the four things. This is what it means. This is what the shahada means. The, these four things. That you make the tasdeek of everything he brought. That you obey him in what he commanded. You keep away from what he prohibited. And you do not worship Allah except by what he commanded. Uh, this, this, uh, this is the uh, meaning of the shahada. Okay, this now brings us to the fifth and final point as it relates to the messengers and which we finish with today, inshallah, which is that whoever rejected a single messenger after he had knowledge, then he is in fact a rejecter of every single messenger and prophet. If you deny one messenger or one prophet, you have denied all of the prophets and messengers. So if someone comes along and says, I believe in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I believe in Muhammad But I, I reject such and such messenger Then this person is a kafir He's a disbeliever Because If he rejected one messenger He's rejected all of the messengers When the proof has come to him When, when, when we tell him Look so and so is a messenger Because he's mentioned Here in the Quran or in the Sunnah And it comes to him And he says no I don't believe in that then the proof has been established upon him, he is a disbeliever. Now, what is the proof for this? What is the proof for this? The proof for this is in uh, Surah Al-Shu'ara, Surah 26. And this is a great proof. It's a great proof in the Quran. Surah 26, verse 105. Allah says, كَذَّبَتْ أَوْ مُنُوحِنِ الْمُرْسَلِينَ Surah Al-Shu'ara, which is Surah 26. Surah 26, verse number 105 and 106. Allah says, كَذَّبَتْ قَوْمُ نُوحٍ الْمُرْسَلِينَ إِذْ قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ نُوحٌ أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ Allah says, the people of Nuh denied the messengers, rejected the messengers. When he said to them, when their brother said to them, meaning when Nu said to them, will you not have the taqwa of Allah? Okay, how is this a proof? First of all, look at how Allah says, the people of Nuh rejected the messengers. He said al-mursaleen. He said it in plural. And we know at the same time that Nuh is the first messenger. So how can, how can the people of Nuh salam, be rejecting all of the messengers when we know that Nuh is the very first messenger sent upon this earth, right? This actually is a proof, this ayah is a proof that to deny one messenger or one prophet, you have denied all of the prophets and messengers, no matter which time you are living in, right? So the people of Nuh have denied every single messenger, the one that was sent and the ones that are to be sent, that the ones that haven't been sent. So this ayah is a proof in the Quran, clear proof that uh, by rejecting Nuh, they, because they rejected messengership uh, itself, it means they denied all of messengership. Because all the prophets are brothers, their deen is one, their mothers are different, but their deen is, is, is one, and uh, which is the Tawheed of Allah, the mighty and majestic, and to free oneself from Taghut. And so this is a clear proof. And also in the Quran, we see in Surah Al-Baqarah, right at the very second last verse in the Quran, Allah says, لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المسير Allah says about the believers, we do not distinguish between a single one of his messengers and they say we believe, we hear and we obey 
and we seek your forgiveness, O our Lord, unto you is the return. And in another verse, Allah says about those who disbelieve, وَيُرِيدُونَ أَن يُفَرِّقُوا بَيْنَ اللَّهِ وَرُسُلِهِ That they wish to distinguish and separate between Allah and between His messengers. This is another proof, Surah An-Nisa, Surah 4, verse 150. So this then establishes the point that anyone who denies a single messenger, he has denied messengership as a whole. And this concludes our discussion of the topic of the prophets and Nabiyyin, uh, how we mentioned the angels and the prophets. And we will continue our discussion, inshallah ta'ala, uh, with the books, Al-Qutub, Al-Munazzala, Al-Mursaleen. So there any questions on anything that's been said uh, in today's lesson on this topic? We have a few minutes for that, otherwise we'll conclude our session today, inshallah. Any prophet. Any prophet. Yeah, it refers to any single prophet. Yeah. <coughs> okay, inshallah, we conclude our lesson there today. We'll continue next week at the same time. Inshallah, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa shadu wa ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.